Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, and thank you to everybody who's watching online. This is indeed the publication date of Jeff's book mm -hmm. in America. So he's in the wrong place. At the wrong time. <laughs> Typically. Um, and he says that the book is not on sale here for a couple of weeks. But he, if you if you listen carefully at the end, he'll give you a special promotion code. So you can get it for 25% off. Um, I was just asking Jeff how long we had known each other. And um, we reckon it was probably about 20 years. Um, at that point, Jeff was a recovering journalist uh, on his way through being an internet guru to being um, a, a fully fledged professor. Um, and he's written um, uh, a number of books. And I, I, I always found him worth listening to. He, he was always an enormous enthusiast for everything digital. Um, he had a, a way of looking over the horizon and seeing where things were going. Uh, and he was extremely generous with his uh, time, with his thoughts and with his energy and with his enthusiasm. Uh, and um, it's fair to say, Jeff, that not all journalists uh, appreciated um, what you were saying <laughs> uh, and were quite cross with him much of the time because he was quite cold eyed about what journalism was doing, what it could do, what it couldn't do uh, and where journalism was going. Um, but you never let that put you off um, and it, it, this um, it, and, and his energy I was, I was looking to see how many times he tweeted in his life you'll discover he speaks very fast so if he's speaking too fast somebody tell him to slow down and he's tweeted 196,000 times in his life no <laughs> um, and he just has that sort of irrepressible energy that will become apparent as we talk um, anyway he has written this book with um, what strikes me until you understand what it is as a slightly clunky title, um, because the, the phrase, the Gutenberg parenthesis, which I think Jeff will uh, describe what that actually means, <laughs> it was not his, but, but it came from an academic, that's why it's clunky. <laughs> um, but it deals with three periods. It was before printing, printing, and the period that we're now in. And I've, I've chosen three paragraphs at random to, to describe um, uh, those periods. So before printing, this is Jeff's from, from the book, stories and information were passed along mouth to mouth by family, friend, traveler, town crier, and balladeer. News, rumor, verse, and song could evolve, would evolve along the way. Knowledge and memory were collective, collaborative, often performative using rhyme and lyric. There was little sense of authorship or ownership of information or tale before. Middle. Then halfway through the 15th century along came Johannes Gutenberg with his Bible and the develop of movable type. His parenthesis opened with the printed book knowledge came to be bound in covers with a beginning and an end. This is how print gained trust. Society gravitated from collective credibility to that of certified expert, honoring the graduate, the professor, the published writer. Print gave birth to the author as authority. The middle. And now the other side of the parenthesis, now comes the internet and the closing of the parenthesis. Today, as the world moves past the Gutenberg era, knowledge is again passed along freely, link by link, clink by click by click, remixed and remade along the way. The value of authorship and ownership of content is diminished thus. Is that a, a fair summary of what, what you're trying to say? So, yes, <laughs> yes. Tell us, tell us how you got... Because you've, you, because I've always thought of you as being so future fo focused and so seeing over the future horizons. It was a surprise to me when I learned you were going to be writing about the 15th century. So <laughs> tell, tell me how and why. Um, first, thank you for having me. It's always an honor to be with you, Alan. And, and I've learned so much from Alan over the years, uh, over our 20 years together. Um, and he's too generous and too kind. And it was a mistake ever listening to me, as he'll tell you. But but uh, we maintained our friendship nonetheless. Um, I was fascinated by Gutenberg as a character first. I wrote a piece for Wired Germany on uh, what I called Gutenberg the Geek. Um, he was the proto-entrepreneur. Uh, he solved all kinds of technological problems. He uh, had to raise uh, risk capital, right? So I taught entrepreneurial journalism. So it, it seemed, seemed nicely parallel, like a parallel. And um, so I wrote that as just a little piece. It was on Kindle Single. Um, and the book I wanted to write was a book about the death of the mass 
mass media, mass marketing, mass audience, and the idea of the mass, which I've always found to be insulting to the public. And I read a lot of sociology, and I said that I'm not qualified to write that book. And I thought for a bit, and then I saw Tom Pettit is the, is the academic from University of Southern Denmark, uh, along with his colleagues, Lars Ole Sauerberg and Marianne Borch, who came up with this notion of the Gutenberg parenthesis. And Tom came to MIT uh, to give a talk. He's very academic. He's, he's British, um, um, <laughs> but, but lives in Southern Denmark. And um, a delightful character. And I said, wow, what a, what a coincidence it is that things start to look like things looked before Gutenberg. And he basically said, no, you idiot. That's why we call it a parenthesis. And he, and he explained that, tell me if I'm wrong, that in, in England, parenthesis is what's inside. In America, it's the symbols. So calling it the parenthesis sets it apart. And so it made me wonder what lessons there were to be had from our entry into one age as we enter into a next age. And it's important to emphasize that we don't leave print. Print doesn't die. We retain all the lessons we had from the age of print, but we can now recapture some of the lessons that we left behind in what is diminished as medieval. Now, I'm, I'm sure everybody in the audience and watching understands completely what Gutenberg did and who he was. You've said he was an entrepreneur, but explain what it was in particular that revolutionized the world. It's important to say that the movable type was developed before in China and Korea, though it didn't spread from there. We don't think there's a connection to Gutenberg, but we don't know, it could have been an inspiration. Uh, but in the Western canon, it starts in Mainz in the, and Strasbourg in the 1440s, 1450s. Um, and what he created, and there's still some debate to this day, we don't know exactly how he printed, though we presume that we know much about it because that there was no eureka moment that came 80 years later that said, oh my God, they've been doing it wrong all these years. I just discovered how to do it. Thanks, right. So we're going to presume that much of how printing occurred up until 1800, very much unchanged, was true back then. So being able to sculpt a letter on a piece of steel um, and, and this little tiny piece of steel in actual size and then pound that into a piece of copper, softer metal, and then put that into a, an adjustable mold and pour a mixture of lead, antimony, and tin into it and, and replicate letters. So Marshall McLuhan said this was the first ditto machine. The ability to replicate thousands of letters uh, to be able to create the Bible and his other first works um, he went through all, that was, that, that was the real invention. We think the printing, the printing press was not the invention. It was used probably for um, binding books or pressing wine or pressing olives or whatever. But the handheld mold, which again, we don't know that he used, but we presume that he did. There are other theories. Uh, but that handheld mold to make letters at scale was the, the key invention that he made. So then the, the type is all put into the page, um, it's inked, piece of paper put over, put it in the press, press down, come back out. And that sounds laborious. If you think I should have brought a piece of type with me, this little tiny piece of type, you know, every single letter of everything that was ever set in type for um, 450 years was set one little letter at a time. And then if you had a bestseller, you, you only had so much type, you couldn't afford to let it stand. So you had to take it out and redistribute it back to the type case. And then if you had a bestseller and you wanted to make more copies, you reset the whole damn thing again. That sounds terribly laborious, but given the difference between that and a scribe, it was incredibly fast and, and brought printing and brought text to scale. Uh, Elizabeth Eisenstein wrote a wonderful book, Printing Press is an Agent of Change, and that's really what inspired me in the end. Um, and neither she nor I are technological determinists. There was not, something was not set in, in motion by that, but without print, other things wouldn't have happened. So when people tend to think about the, the invention of movable type, they tend to think about the shift from scribes to books. But describe the, the, the world of communication aside from scribes that existed pre-1450, because that's, that's, that's the parenthesis, isn't it? Exactly. Um, I'm starting to read it. I just came across a concept that I had not heard of before called FAMA, F-A-M-A, have you ever heard of that? 
uh, I'm sure you took Latin in school, but I did not. So I think it means in Latin, it is said. And it's a a concept that I think we're going to have to return to now uh, as our institutions and media fail at scale. And what it's just about, about truth and reputation and that people had to understand the veracity of what they heard and who they heard it from. And the reputation mattered. And, and so Fama is, I think, where communication was. You knew the, um, the innkeeper who talked to the person who came in from Florence, and you believed the innkeeper because the, the innkeeper screwed up. You're not going to believe him anymore. And that sense of credibility, I think, was what existed. Now, it's important to note that when print began, um, it was not seen at all as reliable. Quite the contrary, it had no no clear provenance. Anybody could make this stuff. Sound familiar, right? So it took some time before print took on authority. It did not happen at the beginning. It was filled with error. It also spread witchcraft. You know, Malleus Maleficarum. It spread uh, how to kill witches. It did bad things too. Um, so that there was there was a shift that was very slow in taking. Also, the book itself, the the incunabular period, the infant period of print. It's 1450 to 1500. It was only then that it gained things like title pages and page numbers and indexes. Uh, and I see the author of a book about indexes right there. And um, uh, the book as we know it now didn't come until about uh, uh, 1500. So again, there, there'll be lots of learned people in this audience who, who know this, but what were the main societal results of the, the, the printed book of believable time? I, I don't know, because I, I don't want to be a determinist. Um, I, I think that there are things that couldn't have happened without it. Interestingly, around 1500, the business was in, the, the industry was in tatters. Um, venture capital rushed in to produce um, classics, because what the scribes were there to do was to preserve the ancients, and they, they they absolutely flooded the marketplace, and they begged for help from Rome to do something about this. Rome didn't help, but Martin Luther did. So it was Martin Luther who really invigorated the industry of print. And whether or not he he hammered the theses into the door, I don't care. It was the sound of Raoul Gutenberg's press croaking in Wittenberg with the theses. And before that, presses croaking with the sound of making indulgences um, and the counter-reformation of the church against Luther and the Pope against Luther that I think really had a, a, the, 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 was the growth of print. Now, what comes with it as well, of course, is the Thirty Years' War and the Reformation, the counter-reformation. I was debating in Perugia, I was, a few years ago, I was debating a German regulator, all kinds of fun. And... Um, and I said, well, you know, we're going through a similar transition now. Who knows? We could have a 30 years war ahead of us. And the German regulator said, it is too soon to joke about that. <laughs> it, it wasn't joking. <laughs> so you, the, all, all this happened. I mean, you, you described the, the bit in the middle as lasting about 570 years. Mm -hmm. um, just talk a bit about uh, what happened to sort of notions of authority and authorship and expertise? You've described the, the early years, which were a bit chaotic, but well, that's the chaos we're living in now. But what, what happened to, uh, with, with the benefit of hindsight, what, what, what just describe what happened and, and what, what that the, print wouldn't have happened. One of the most striking moments to me was 1470, Niccolo Perotti, a um, translator was much offended by a bad shoddy translation of Pliny. And he beseeched the Pope in what is said to be the first call for censorship in print. And he said to the Pope, he wrote to the Pope and said, you must do something. You must appoint a censor to check all these forms before they go out because this is just crap. And as I thought about that, I thought it wasn't a call for censorship at all. What he was seeking was the institutions that would then follow of editing and publishing. And he was asking for some assurance and mechanisms of quality, which came and which, you know, the predecessor to you. Um, now, I wonder whether those institutions are sufficient to the scale of speech that we have today, but they were for a very long time. 
And I think once there was fixity in print, once there were institutions of editing and publishing, and at first, of course, the printer was in charge of everything. The, there created more jobs that came along, um, bookseller, editor, publisher, there became institutions like the stationer's company here in, in Britain um, to try to assure quality, also to control it and to censor it as well. I think that's those institutions are what are so important. And I think that's one of the lessons about going into the future is whether we need to reinvent, reshape, replace, or support the institutions that we had to try to find authority, quality, fixity again. In, in, in the timescale that you described throughout this book, uh, you, you date the internet as uh, the, the, the invention of Netscape Navigator, yeah. which was 1994, right? So that, that, that's how you arrive at your 570 years since 1454. Um, so so he, uh, in using that timeline, we're in approximately 1480. In, in, in Gutenberg years, in, yes. in Gutenberg years of where we are at the moment, which I always think is a useful way of thinking about um, people pronouncing on on the, the internet. You, you think, well, hold on, we're, we're still quite early days. Um, do you want to talk a bit about that? That your your perception of of whether that's a useful way of thinking about where we are in the, the internet. Matthew Kirschenbaum, who's a wonderful scholar at the University of Maryland, who was my reviewer number one for the book, uh, argues against that, and, and, and along with many, and says, "No, Jarvis, you're wrong. This change we're undergoing is 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 volcanic and fast." I think not, uh, which is to say, we have a lot more ahead of us, maybe including the Thirty Years' War. Um, what struck me most in this timeline was that it was 150 years after movable type before we saw a rush of invention with print. Around just a few years each way around 1600, we saw the creation of the modern novel with Cervantes, the creation of the essay with Montaigne, the creation of a market for printed plays with Shakespeare, and the creation of the newspaper. And I think it took that long for the technology to become boring and for the technologists to be demoted and replaced in their function and their power, and for others to come along and realize what they could do with this. So in that timeline, 1454 about, Bible comes off press. Um, 1600, the, in, the incunabular infant age is over and the book begins to take the shape that we know now. 1600, we see this rush of innovation with print. 1710, we get the Statute of Anne and the first real business model for print and copyright. And the idea that creativity is property. Is some as, a, as an asset to be traded. The technology of print does not change in any marketable way, marketable way until 1800, where we get stereotyping, which was the molding of pages, um, so you didn't have to reset the type every time. Uh, the steel press, the steam-powered press, um, paper made from wood pulp instead of precious uh, uh, fabric. Uh, fabric was uh, old rags and bloomers were a strategic asset that were not allowed to be exported from England because we, they were needed for paper. Uh, now you can make it for wood pulp. Um, and then finally, my most beloved machine there is, the linotype, which replaced that setting of the type one letter at a time, making a line at a time. So that's what led then to the mechanization, industrialization of print, the mass market, that changed all over again. But between 1450 and 1800, things didn't change a great deal because the scale was still fairly small. What struck me, Alan, was that before that, that mechanization, the average circulation of a daily newspaper in the US was 4,000. It was a Substack newsletter, right? And, um, and by the way, today, if you had a Substack newsletter with 10 bucks a month from your readers, you, you, you're okay, you make a living. Um, and so then we reached this tremendous scale. We reached the advertising market. It was in the late 1890s when a magazine publisher realized that, um, oh, I can lose money selling the magazine and make it up on advertising. And that leads to the market that we have, the attention marketplace leads into the internet, right? Radio comes along as the first competitor to print in the 1920s, TV in the 1950s. Um, 
And so I think there's, there's that, when you think about that, that's a tremendous amount of activity to get us to where we see print today, different from pr print for what it was a century or two centuries ago. So as, as we get to the, the end of the parenthesis, can you talk a little about power and where that lies? Because in the printing, whatever else printing presses were, they were expensive, and as were TV studios and broadcasting studios. Uh, and there was very centralized power. And, and you speculate as to where that power is going to go and whether those who held the power, who generally don't like the internet very much, are, are going to cede it, cede it and whether they whether it's possible to prevent it being seeded. I think you're right. I think, again, when print was operated at a smaller scale, if you look at the first magazines, if you look at Spectator here, um, and then Ben Franklin's first magazine and so on, they, they, they also operated a small scale in a few thousands, right? Um, and yes, you had to have the money and the capital to have a printing press, but, but people could print a lot of stuff. There was a lot of ephemera. It wasn't just books. It was also news books and pamphlets and ballads and proclamations and bureaucracy. Print was all of this. I think power shifted immensely and it became based on capital when the machines came in. Because then you had to have a lot of money to afford uh, printing presses. Um, uh, one, one little anecdote that I love is that the, the Times of London has been at the center of uh, disruption of labor more than once uh, because it was the first um, uh, steam powered presses were used, uh, the, the uh, printers were told to hang tight for some late breaking news from the continent. Unbeknownst to them next door, uh, the first steam powered presses were publishing an edition of the Times. The owner came in with a pile of papers and said, you're replaced. <laughs> and if you don't cause too much trouble, we'll help you find another job. Uh, and if you do cause trouble, I'll cause trouble back. And of course, whopping came, you know, years later, it's, it's around the Times. So I think, I think the power shifted there was always a matter of power of who could speak, who could print, who owned that. But it was a little more diffuse in the early days. Then it concentrated immensely around capital. And I, part of my theory of what we see now, what the internet has really done is enabled the voices who were always there, but never heard and never represented in mainstream mass media run by people who look like us. I'll, I'll, I'll say this for myself, old white men you're not so old, um, to finally be heard. And that's what is resented by those who held power, those who, who, who knew it was what. And so, uh, you know, I've learned a lot looking at, for example, Black Twitter and seeing not just Black Lives Matter, which matters immensely, but there's a, there's a wonderful author named Andre Brock Jr. who wrote a book called Distributed Blackness about how Twitter enabled communities, plural, to find a place to be themselves not under white gaze, not under the measurement of white mass media. Um, and so, and I think that white mass media and white power structures resent that tremendously. And I think what we see, I'll go overboard here. I think in a sense, Black Lives Matter is, a, is, is the Reformation and January 6th is the Counter-Reformation. Oversimplification, I grant, but neat for its purposes, for my purposes. Um, Still a hack at heart. Uh, yes. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, I, I, I think we've only begun to see this power struggle. Yeah. Talking of power struggle and, and journalism, you, you, you at one point paused to ask, well, what is the internet? And you write this, my colleagues in the media see the world godlike in their image and call the net a medium, a new third subset of media alongside print and broadcast. I say the opposite is true. Media are becoming a subset of the network together with most every other sector of society, all drawn into its black hole gravity. That's why as a journalism professor, I'm more interested in studying the internet than media. Media are a creation of Gutenberg's age. The net is something else. Can you just elaborate on that? What do you that? think about that? Uh, I fear it's true. Ah, why, why fear? Uh, well, because it counters, I mean, I think this is why a lot of journalists don't like you. Uh, because it, it seems to undermine the craft of whatever it is, 300, 400 years, yes. and, and, and we feel threatened enough anyway. And, and you come along and give us unwelcome news. Do you think the internet is a medium? You obviously say, I don't, but do you? Uh, Have you thought of it as a medium? Well, no, I, I think it is, it is everything now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, yeah, I think that we don't know what it is yet. 
fully. Yeah. We don't understand it. We're still, um, McLuhan would say that- 14, you know, 14 ages six, yeah. Right, right. <laughs> um, and McLuhan would say that every new medium uses as its content the old medium. Mm. And so books, magazines, and newspapers are predominantly recognizable as such on the internet. We haven't really broken out yet, I think, to invent as Cervantes and Montaigne and um, Shakespeare's friends and the newspaper creator instead. Um, so I, I think um, one of the reasons I don't like it to be called a medium is because, especially in this country, then the reflex is to regulate it as a medium and to say, and to expect it to be cleaned and polished and published as a medium. When it's not, uh, one of the things that I, I emphasize most is that I think that early print was conversational. And, and it, we lost the conversation with mechanization in the mass. Early print, um, Luther and the Pope were in contentious dialogue through their books and bonfires of them. Um, uh, Erasmus and his best friend, Thomas More, wrote books and dedications to each other uh, and included letters and dialogue from real people in them, which I found fascinating. And so I think we lost that conversation. And I, and I mark a moment of trying to recapture it when you started Comment is Free, um, which was controversial and which a lot of the journalists didn't like because it took away their, tell me if I'm wrong, their special place as the gatekeepers, as the writers, as the voice. And you augmented, you didn't replace them, but you augmented it with that. Mm -hmm. And I think that was so important and, and, and important to note the courage it took with the legal structure you have here as opposed to what we have in the United States still, mm -hmm. um, to try to recapture that notion of, of conversation and dialogue. I think that's, what really happens with the internet is that, the, is that voices can do what they want. And also, I think there's other things. I think I, I love TikTok, oddly, um, because I think it's the first maybe native to the internet application because it's so collaborative. Um, I, I, I await my students coming up with new things. I held a course uh, with a friend of mine, Douglas Rushkoff, um, a year ago in what we call reinventing the internet. And the students were master's age students. And I should have seen this going in, but they were all of the age where they didn't know the early hopeful internet. They only knew the corporate internet and they couldn't imagine the internet before or after that. And so that's what frightens me is between a lack of imagination um, and courage to change and innovate and then an effort by those in power to prevent that innovation and that change. I, I fear the fate of the internet then. So I can be accused of trying to defend Google or Facebook. I'm not. I'm trying to defend the freedoms of the net and the, and the, and the prospects that we have. And we have decisions to make. We can make very bad decisions. We've made some very bad ones and we'll continue to do that. Uh, but part of the reason I want to look back is to learn the lessons so we can make better decisions about the future. Uh, two more questions and I, then I hope we can open up to um, people who I hope are sending in questions here. Uh, or, or debate or, or, or debate challenges or, or anything you like. Um, so one is about, you, you've got an, a, a kind of recantation in the book. You, you say that you, you were talking about a, a newspaper that can change by the minute. And you recall that in an earlier book, you called for an evolving book so that any volume could be updated, searched, corrected, linked, and discussed. You say that was the wrong way of thinking. Um, what, what, what changed your mind? Studying the book as much as I did in this process, I came to respect it all the more. There's, let me see if I can find this really quickly. There's a great quote from Umberto Eco, um, who wrote a, um, who was in a, a dialogue with two friends in a book called, um, I think it's, this is not the end of the book. And Echo said, the book is like the spoon, scissors, the hammer, the wheel. Once invented, it cannot be improved. And so uh, much presumptions comes into this thing that part of the Gutenberg parenthesis idea and is that, is that knowledge became contained and we presumed that it had an alpha and an omega. And it's that straight line that McLuhan talked about from one to the next. And that this is how we cognize the world. And now online, um, things have no beginning, they have no end. 
Um, they start now and go backwards. They go the wrong way. They're conversational. They're they're not linear. They're all over creation. Um, and so me trying to suggest that's what the book should be was a mistake because this becomes, I think, the standard of which against which we judge our future. Um, do we find the ways for fixity and authority in the future of these new things? Do we find the challenge of filling this with something worth saying? Um, do we do we re Imagine scarcity, not based around power, but around quality. Um, so, so yes, I recanted and I said, let the book be the book. Well, my final question is, is about who are the new gatekeepers? So you've got the, the people who held the power, I think, gradually realizing that the power is, is sifting away. But who, who are the new gatekeepers and what are your hopes and concerns about them? I'm working on a next book. Um, that I probably regret signing to do, but it's about the internet because I figure I got to do a book about the internet. Um, and the part I'm writing right now, uh, I just wrote on the train down here from St. Andrews. Um, the, the chapter heading was Demote the Geeks. Because um, I think when I mentioned earlier that that when printing in the early days of printing, the, the, the printers were in charge. They had to be. They did everything. They chose what to print. They printed it. They They sold it. They figured it all out. Um, and if you started a newspaper in 1900, you wouldn't put the typesetter in charge. You wouldn't put the press, button, press operator in charge, right? Of course not. You wouldn't think of doing that. Yet the geeks are still in charge of the internet. And that was probably necessary. They knew how to build things. But I think that we have seen that there, and again, I defend the internet and I'm, I'm not need, I, I still respect, I wrote a book called What Would Google Do? I you know, was a Google fanboy. I kind of still am. I think it's a pretty miraculous thing that they built. So I'm not diminishing them. Zuckerberg now looks good next to Musk. <laughs> um, and Musk teaches us that we must never let this thing be centralized again, the way media and conversation and public discourse were. So I think we're gonna need companies and we're gonna need some geeks. But if you were gonna start a service today, I was thinking about this coming down on the train. If you were gonna start, you say, hey, I wanna start a service where I'm gonna connect all the people on earth and they can share with each other and they, and they, and they can find their friends. Who would you put in charge of that? A geek with no social skills? <laughs> or an anthropologist or a psychologist or a party planner, right? Um, Google, should Google, I mean, Google's a lot of things and it's becoming more corporate than consumer focused as they kill products, but who should be in charge of Google? Perhaps a librarian or a journalist because it's about information. And so I think we've got to guard against allowing things like Twitter to be controlled centrally such that a narcissistic nihilist can take it over. And even Jack Dorsey knows that and said it was a mistake to make Twitter a company. And I held a black Twitter summit at my school. Uh, I was host, but four wonderful scholars uh, convened the people there. And among the people we had there was one of the early coders of Twitter. And he tried to make it federated and open in the early days. But no, the board said, no, we've got to own this. We've got to get, you know, get a return on investment. And there's competitive things out there now like Mastodon and Blue Sky that I admire because they're, they're trying to create an open source structure like WordPress is open source. I think that's a model of where we go where we um, use the geeks as we need to, but don't put them in charge anymore. And it's not about gatekeeping so much as I think enabling. And um, journalists are, are bad at this because they, they love that idea of gatekeeping, right? Uh, that's not what it's about anymore. It's about uh, enabling people to be themselves and talk as they wish to. Um. Uh, have we got any, is there a question you want to kick off with there? And then we've got a question at the back here. Uh, we do have one question. We do have one question from the chat, um, which is what happened to Guardian Unlimited Talk? Um, was there any version of it possible for a newspaper? Yeah, I know where that's coming from. I'll come back to that later. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he signaled that on Twitter a long time ago. It was a big mistake. Yeah, back at the back. Hello, hi. Um... I'm a massive fan of the concept of the good of parenthesis and have been for ages. Um, Jeff, before you wrote the book, and I'm really looking forward to reading it. Um, 
but the the principle kind of gives this idea that we we had a sort of norm we had the mass media era and now we've gone back to sort of a normal though obviously it's a different normal but on the internet most people are passive consumers still of, of information and most of the people who get read the most and who are communicating information are huge mass broadcasters you know they are influencers and yeah their influencers may be in hock to a different set of masters you know different people own the printing presses is it is it really a parenthesis or isn't it sort of a weird it's it's still an evolution rather than a parenthesis yeah I, I think it's not even a combination of the two it's surely it's a weird amalgamation that's taken us into a turbocharged world it, parenthesis is surely the wrong word for this it, Tom Pettit, who brought the concept to the U.S. at MIT, says that the the the, the parenthesis he acknowledges that the word is a little misleading because it seems like a sharp border, but it's not. The exit from the Gutenberg age could take decades, generations, even centuries. And again, look how long it took us to enter into the age of print, and if we think that things supersede each other, which they don't necessarily do. But the scribe didn't disappear probably until the typewriter. Right? So, so the scribal skills stayed for a long time. Manuscript stayed for a long time. Um, and the typewriter and then the typesetter changed our conception a bit of perfection in, in word, right? So yes, I think, I think that it's, it's a little misleading in that this could be a very long transition, which it, I think gives me hope that we have time to learn lessons. We have time to figure things out. Um, you know, that word you mentioned, influencer, uh, amuses me because if you were going to have people that you were going to call influencers, wouldn't you hope that they might be professors and scientists and experts? In, and, I, and I love I love the internet. I love the fact that everyone can speak. I, I respect that. But we can even rethink the concept of who, who influences us. Um, and that's in our hands to do. I think whenever we do anything we do on the internet, we make the internet of the future. One professor who's a very famous influence with a huge audience is uh, Jordan Peterson. Um, so, <laughs> hey, we can hope for that. Yeah, and as, I, as I've been researching the next book, I've gotten really scared of the professors who influence um, Sam Altman and um, Elon Musk and Peter Thiel and company with their philosophy of long-termism and effective altruism and transhumanism. And basically, fuck the present. We have to worry about the future of 10 to the 58th future human beings, real and computerized. It's wacky shit, right? So, and, and, it's, and it's led by two professors from Oxford. Uh, so yeah, professors ain't necessarily um, assured of their influencer status properly. Question here. Do we need to get the can we just get the mic for the for the stream? Paying for content. Um, do you think the Patreon model is still the way to go or that there's something else out there? There's a long answer to that, which I'll spare you now. But I think um because part of the obnoxious thing I do in the book is question the idea of content. That 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 notion that, that the content fills things services accomplish things. So, and we talked a lot about membership uh, at The Guardian. And, um, and, and I think that moving past the idea of subscription and paying for access to content in a time when content is abundant, and we ain't seen nothing yet with large language models, it's going to commodify content extremely, I think. So if we put our value in this idea of content, we're going to lose. We put our value instead and find value and create value in relationships and service, then I think we have another opportunity. So yes, Patreon, I think, is a very good model for where to go. If you have a relationship that there's tears in it, that you, you, you present value, you're supporting things. I was struck when The Guardian went to what is basically its begging model, which I think is a very good model. There were people who said uh, among the readers, we're willing to pay so that it's free to the world. That's quite important, I think, right? And there's many different reasons that people may give you money and you have to be ready to serve them according to their desires. It could be to have access to journalists or access to a community or access to information or a sense of accomplishment at making something happen or um, access to bargains 
who knows, right? So we have to reimagine ourselves past, I think, this idea of content into community and conversation and service. Um, yes, there. Pass it right behind you. Yeah, I'll come to you, sir. Um, just to change the gender mix oh, a bit. Okay, yeah. Accepting the premise that we're in 1486, I hope I've got the date. 1480, actually. 1480, yeah. and leaving aside issues of speed of process, what do you think is going to happen next and over what time scale? I have no fucking idea, <laughs> which I think is part of the point. I mean, I think the most hubristic job title that exists is futurist. Um, I can't tell what's going to happen in a few years because, because the, the point is that nothing's determined. We have choices. And those choices are going to determine where things go and what happens. Um, so I don't know. And I think that I actually find hope in that. Some fear, because we can fuck it up again. Um, but you know, again, look at print. 30 Years' War, Reformation, Counter-Reformation, Peasants' Wars. Uh, uh, you know, I would argue that that the Reformation ain't over yet. It's still going on. And the wars that we see are still are a great measure of result of, of, of those things. Is the 30 years war still going on in Ukraine now, in essence? Um, so we can screw up a lot. But all in all, we figured out print. I start the book with a long quote from Mark Twain, um, who said, the world today, good and bad, it owes to Gutenberg. Everything can be traced to the source, but we are bound to bring him homage for what he said in dreams to the angered angel has been literally fulfilled for the bad that his colossal innovation invention has brought about is overshadowed a thousand times by the good with which mankind has been favored. I hope the same will be true of the internet. Um, I was actually pointing at the gentleman in front, but we'll, we'll come to you after, just because he's been so patient and then you, yeah. Yeah, I tell my students, never ask a question that you don't know the answer to. So I'm going to violate that principle. Um, but my excuse is that I know nothing about this field. Uh, but I wanted to ask you a question which may or may not have resonances in other domains. So it's fairly well established that fundamental subjects like mathematics were changed irrevocably by the adoption of new forms of representation in the 16th, 17th, 18th century. So think about that. I mean, it really means that by changing the notation, the fundamental structures of the knowledge domain are changed. So it's clear that the other way around works, but that's less clear, I think. I wonder if there's any similarities in your own field. Are there ways in which the units of analysis in um, your field are similar in any way, have been, have been radically changed in any way? by the adoption of new representational forms. What's your field? Mathematics. Mathematics. Um, I bow to you because I was really crappy at that. <laughs> I, I, I think it's a really, really interesting question around that notion of, of, notion of notation. Um, I back up a little bit. Uh, Elizabeth Eisenstein, who wrote the, the, what was really the founding text of book history. It's amazing that book history as a field didn't exist before, in great measure, before the before the 1970s, um, and she, what she noted was that when scholars no, no no longer needed to travel to the books, the books could travel to the scholars. When um, students could now read on their own, when scholars in multiple places could be operating off the same text and comparing, and competing, that that was changing. And I think that the, the notation you talk about, I can be very wrong about this, but I almost sense that that comes out of that then, out of the need to create that for standardization of a language across that kind of uh, collaboration. What happens now, I don't know. I think our field is just, our field is old fashioned as can be. Um, you know, we're not good at data. We're, we pretend we are, but we're not. Um, journalists pride themselves in not knowing math. Um, we're not good at covering science. So I don't think that our field has changed. I think what will happen is fields around us will change and we better be able to witness that and understand it. 
Is, do you want to pass the microphone just behind you? Uh, you were saying, and Alan, I agree with Alan, that I fear that uh, the internet is not a medium, it's taken everything over. Uh, at the moment, we have something called the Online Safety Bill going through Parliament. Uh, it makes me wonder whether it's completely pointless or or how we're going to regulate. I love your enthusiasm about the internet, but it's full of the most appalling crap uh, everywhere and poisonous and dangerous, is it not? What, what do you think about all that regulation? Well, I'll, I'll quote Eisenstein again, who says that, that you know, w with print came amazing and miraculous new good stuff, but good shit, but a lot of bad shit came too. Right, that it brought out the wizards and the alchemy. And what it what back to your question too is that when the alchemists couldn't show their work, which was required of print, it finally cut down their credibility and their power. So yeah, there's crap online. Um, as I'm fond of saying, I used to say this of Twitter, but Twitter is now just is ugh. so so let's say the internet is not the New York Times, it's Times Square. And as you walk through Times Square, you will see smart people and stupid people, and you will hear smart things and wrong things, as ever in humanity, right? Um, I think the reflex, and I live here in the land of regulatory reflex right, at the moment, right? Or a, a visit. Um, I think the reflex to regulate is ill thought through. Um, I was part of a um, transatlantic high-level working group on content moderation and freedom of expression, breath. And uh, some of the creators of the uh, now online safety bill, formerly the online harms bill, uh, you know, spoke to the group. And um, they've taken out, they've excised out, which I think was the most dangerous and stupid part of it, which was to require platforms to take down legal but harmful speech, unable to see that if the government calls it harmful and tells you you must take it down, it is de facto de jure illegal, right? That's gone at least but privacy and encryption and all kinds of other things. I quote an essay from the Rand Corporation in 1998, I think, same year as Google. Uh, James Dewar uh, also was inspired by Elizabeth Eisenstein, also inspired to look back at print. And he argued that those countries that tried to control print were left behind in other arenas of progress. And that those who allowed it to occur, if you look at, if you look at, 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 at um, the Dutch Republic, probably not on purpose, but just because of looser reality, things that weren't allowed to be printed in this country were printed there and imported here secretly, right? Things that weren't allowed in France were printed in the Dutch Republic. And um, he argues that print, like the internet, will have a future of unintended consequences. And Dewar says it's best to get to those unintended consequences sooner so we can figure out how to deal with them instead of thinking that we can forestall them. It is hubris of regulators to think that they can forestall um, so much of human behavior. And we already have the laws to deal with the human behavior that really matters. So I, I, I know I may sound like a libertarian at this moment. I'm not. I'm a Joe Biden Democrat, but um, and a goal guardian reader um, and prospect reader now. Um, but I do think we've got to let, we've got to have some faith in ourselves, some ability to uh, let the internet and humanity go with it and see where it goes as we then do it. It sounds like we've got a question here. Um, yeah, there's one. Do you, think there is, do you think there is a place for genuine quality control on the internet? And if so, how do you think it's possible to prevent copyright lawyers from being fully in charge? The, the question at the beginning was, uh, is, is there a place for quality control on the internet? Um, I think the copyright is outmoded. Uh, again, it goes back to this concept of content. And that, that, that our value lies in this thing that we can hold. Uh, I think that's 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 ill thought through. And I think what large language models are going to do, as I said before, is to commodify content, and it takes away our special status. Sorry, as writers, that's what made us special. Is that we could write and we could edit. Um, at least Alan can. And um, now there's text everywhere. Every every schmo can do it on the street, and now a machine can do it at a huge scale. So it makes us recalculate our value. So I speculate in the book about a probably a dumb idea that I called uh, credit right uh, versus copyright, which was that um, if we want to support creativity and the string of creativity that occurs, we might need mechanisms 
to enable uh, contributions to that creativity to be recorded and rewarded if we wish. If, um, if you uh, tell someone a story and you turn it into a poem and you turn it into a song lyric and you add music to it and you perform it and you put it in your film and you spread it all around, those are contributions to creativity. And copyright doesn't recognize that kind of structure. Um, and I know what I've just said might sound like it's Bitcoin. I'm not trying to, or and blockchain. I'm not trying to go there. Um, but, but there is a chance, I think, for rethinking creativity in a very fundamental way. And again, where the value lies there. Question on the front here. If regulation isn't the answer, what is? I think you've partly answered that. But I think the whole question of power and how power used to be in the hands of very few people. We know that's the revolution. But what about how challenging, and we haven't even mentioned artificial intelligence, so I will. <laughs> um, are governments losing, they are losing power, whether it's in the West or wherever in the world, because we still have these cycles of elections, uh, five year cycle, three year cycle, or whatever it is. And yet, this extraordinary revolution, ongoing revolution, with all kinds of consequences, and everybody on the internet uh, does not have positive, there are very positive things, but I'm trying to think of, in French, we would say nifest, that are negative you know, ways of looking at it. So that whole governments, it's not just journalists who feel challenged, governments mm -hmm. are fundamentally challenged by what is going on in the internet. How do you see that developing and, and then, trying to harness, and I won't, I'll just evoke very quickly to do with the French protests. We've witnessed uh, kids of 12, 14, 15, we won't go into the socially or political thing, but just, you know, rendezvous at the local mall or the Champs-Elysees and let's make a spectacular. So the challenge to governments. I, I think one of the lessons that I came through in thinking this book through was that every institution is challenged. And again, we have the opportunity to support it, to reform it, to replace it. Um, and that's in part up to, and by institution, I don't just mean organizations, of course, I mean institutions like copyright, like the idea of content, like journalism, like the mass um, and government. One of the most important decisions made in the early days of print, I come to see, uh, I just was visiting with uh, Andrew Pedigree at the University of St. Andrews. He's really, he's the dean of book historians. We have now. You're next, but he's still he's still there. Um, uh, and uh, he did work on Reformation and on and on Luther. And what you see is that Luther's decision to print number one and to print in German number two was critical, a vital decision. He could have printed in Latin. He could have not printed and just been a disputation over the issues. He could have printed in Latin and only with a certain audience. But he chose to print in German and thus created a public. Habermas would argue that the public sphere didn't come until the 17th century in the salons and coffee houses of England. There are arguments to say no, it came much earlier. And I would argue that publics could start with as soon as Luther and German. What did that also do? It also standardized language. And um, thus, Benedict Anderson would say that imaginary communities would start around those languages. Oh, we have this commonality, now we have the language. There's another great Umberto Eco line that I quote, that a language is just, or no, a, a, um, um, a dialect is a language without an army and a navy. Uh, so when it becomes a language and when you have this notion of a nation, around that, and then you build up the structure of a government and its institutions. That's nothing to say that that's permanent. And another institution that I would that I don't really write about here, but, but I think I mentioned it, is what's the institution of local? In the United States right now, we have a lot of talk about how um, we must save local journalism, we must save local newspapers. Must, uh, well, okay, I'll salute that flag to some extent. But I live in a town next to Trumpus. They don't like me and I don't like them. Um, my school board is being taken over by them, and they've just outlawed a sociology textbook. Um, so I've got to have to care about them and have to do something, but I really just can't stand the sons of bitches. I live five miles away from Donald Trump's golf course. 
I can feel the disturbance in the force <laughs> when he comes. Right. So what's the definition of local? Yeah, I got to care about my town. But the truth is, my definition of local includes a lot more people right here because of my relationship with Alan and with The Guardian in the past and with Internet people here and with book historians here. And I, I have lots of different communities. I have the community of people who've had prostate cancer. I have communities of people who care about uh, I have a, 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 a book history wonks Twitter list. They matter to me more than my neighbors. So what does it mean to think about um, nations? There, there was a story somewhere, I can't remember where, that's the horrible thing about the internet, you never remember the provenance anymore, uh, about uh, island nations that may well get flooded out. And what comes of their culture and their languages? Do they live elsewhere, right? Are cultures and languages that exist now, it makes us think about this, that exist apart from nations. So yes, nations are challenged. Nations will reflexively regulate and try to control. Many years ago, I went to an event in Paris, um, the EG8, and uh, Sarkozy was on stage, and um, they had a, people they were supposed to call on, and the moderator made the mistake call on me. And I said, Monsieur le Président, uh, how wonderful that you've brought us all together. Um, but I, can, I, can I ask you when you go to the G8, can you, can you take a, a um, Hippocratic oath for the internet and first do no harm? They laughed at me, of course, well, I'm not going to do any harm. And I mentioned that, that I, I talked about a, 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 an American administrator who talked about the internet as an eighth continent. And you could see Sarkozy love that idea. You could see him planting the tricolor <laughs> in that continent and claiming it as his, right? So that, that will be the reflex of governments, I think. Um, and they will fight like hell. And there's no prediction at all that they will be overcome by the internet. And they will look at China, look at Iran, look at Hungary, look at country after country after country as how they're trying to control the internet. I have faith that the voice of the people will out, but we don't know. I think we've got time for one more question. There's a gentleman there that's been very, um, yeah, in, the, in the dark jacket, yeah. Hello, hello. Um, yeah, very good presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure if I agree with the thing about the geeks building technologies uh, because actually you need to be a geek to build the technologies that we need. It's, it's a very complex way to do things, you know. You need to know programming, you need to know logic of computer and things like that. I think the problem to me that happened with geeks is the machine that involves and one the ideas are powerful. The PR organizations, I be, I have had the chance to be close to some of these gigs. Um, I spent one week with Mark Zuckerberg in 20, 2007 when he was just coming with with um, the Facebook, it started to be powerful. And, and that week I had the chance to talk to him about what was his ideal of building that Facebook that now he has created. So I joined Facebook because of him. And it has created too much damage that I've been mean now deleting everything I put on Facebook, right? But then two years later, I met him again, but it was impossible to talk because the powerful machine that was around him, controlling him and things like that. I think, I think there is no escape for the future of geeks building what we need. But I think then what happened with this, these ideas when they are successful, is what creates the problem. And then uh, that's basically what I want to say. Yeah, I think we're still gonna need them, but we don't have to put them in charge. Um, and it's not just the geeks, it's also the venture capitalists, obviously. It's also the public markets that have an impact here. Um, do you remember, I think you were at this event, pardon me for what I'm about to say, in Davos. Uh, <laughs> you blame my credibility. Yeah, yeah, yes, completely. Um, that there was an event where Zuckerberg talked to a room full of editors. I think, I mean, yes, yeah, Murdoch, I know you were there. Murdoch and Salzburg go there. Yeah. And we're not supposed to say because it was all Chatham House rule, but fuck it. Um, so Salzburger um, besieged Zuckerberg. And he said, Mark, tell me, how do I get a community? You build a community. I should have a community in the New York Times. How do I build a community? It was, it was like that, right? I think you said afterwards it was humiliating. And um, so Zuckerberg said, he wasn't media trained yet, right? He still was a geek of few words and, and would speak directly. And he said, you can't. Full stop, geeky stare. 
And after an uncomfortable moment, um, he then elaborated and he said, you're asking the wrong question. He said, you don't make communities. You don't build communities. You don't own communities. Communities already exist. They're already doing what they want to do. What you should do is bring them elegant organization. Oh, right. If only he listened to his own fucking words, <laughs> right? My complaint about Facebook, and I'm eager, I'm eager to hear you talk about this because you're dealing with the issues that come up there. I, our friend Siva Varianathan, who's a professor at the University of Virginia, wrote a book called, he's, he's written the mirror images of my books. I wrote, what would Google do? And he wrote, the Googleization of everything. And I wrote public parts, and he wrote, anti-social media. And Siva argues that it was a mistake fundamentally to try to connect humanity because humanity screwed up and you can't do well. I disagree with him there. I think, no, we, we're connected right here. And good things can happen and bad things happen. So we'll figure it out. The mistake I think that Zuckerberg made in the end and still makes is that he had no North Star. Why are you connecting people? To what end? What's acceptable and what's not? What are we trying to do together? And I don't want him to be the gatekeeper and the controller of it, but I want him to at least put forward a suggestion. So when the, the uh, oversight board started, I attended online the first kind of announcement thing. And I asked the chair, whose name I forget, um, on what basis will decisions be made? And he said, well, there, there's the um, uh, community standards of, of Facebook and there's human rights standards. And there's a lot between those two things, right. right? You got statutes, but you need a constitution and you need you need principles that I don't think still exist. They certainly don't exist anymore. Twitter, I think they did. Twitter was fighting for free speech. Twitter was arguing with governments. Twitter was doing some good things. Facebook was too. But it doesn't know why it exists. It's, it exists to be cool. It exists because it can. It exists. Um, and, and that's why I think that we can see future things that come along. So WordPress, I think, exists to enable people to publish and does a very good job of it in open source. Blue Sky, which was started by Jack Dorsey, um, is going to be federated and can't be owned. Uh, Mastodon, uh, a young German uh, technologist, started it on the Activity Pub uh, uh, platform, uh, protocol rather, not platform. And I think there's opportunities there. So let me just ask you, I'll, I'll ask you one final question. Um, putting you on the spot with 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 the oversight board, but do you sense a developing set of principles? Is that what the oversight board is trying to do? Is to find and declare them? Is the company trying to find them? Do you, do you, what do you when you're given this task to say make this thing better? Better how? Is there a developing sense of that? Uh, I'm not blaming you. I was about to say we're going to get to the drink upstairs. <laughs> uh, My fault. I'll try and, I'll try and get. I mean, uh, yes. I mean, we've we've published about forty judgments. In seventy five percent of the cases, we found that that Facebook is over moderating. So uh, there's a sort of custodianship of free speech that I think Facebook is being too careful about or too uh, over. Um, censorious about but you can see why because they've got a lot of people on their back um but the interesting thing is that the longer we deliberate uh and disagree amongst ourselves is trying to work out what this space is so you say it's Times square we had a fascinating debate about nudity and whether you know there's a lot of pressure especially amongst young people saying free the nipple you know if mm -hmm. women want to take their clothes off on the internet why shouldn't they right and then uh, and so half the board thought that. And the other half of the board thought, well, no, this is like Times Square. If people started taking their clothes off in Times Square. Actually, you can do it in Times Square, but, but okay, keep going. Well, <laughs> <laughs> There's one, hey, one guy York. who came from the, uh, from the, mid, from the Midwest. Uh, yeah. In his town, they didn't take their clothes off in Times Square. <laughs> and uh, and we're, we're currently having an argument about um, things that that people wouldn't blink an eye about in a newspaper, but somehow when spread at scale, um, somehow acquire a different quality. So it's this it's this business, it's 1480. We're still trying to work okay. out what this is. Um, Alan mentioned this beginning just to mention this. Um, well, two things. I want to plug uh, Dennis Duncan's book, Index, A History of the. Isn't that a great title? 
Uh, and also um, the book will come out. Uh, I'm not trying to sell it, but you might as well not pay full price. If you, because of this event tonight, Bloomberg, Bloomsbury, not Bloomberg, Bloomsbury, um, gave a, a discount code. So rather than dictate it to you right now, if you just go to gutenbergparenthesis.com, you'll see it there. If you order through Bloomsbury, it's 25% off. So anybody who wants to, thank you very much. I appreciate it. It's an academic book. It'll be what it is. But I'm, I'm really grateful. This is the first conversation I've done about the book. So it's really been stimulating to me to talk with all of you about this. I appreciate that. There is drink upstairs, so we can continue the conversation in a very well, in a very sponsored speak. by the Townite Center for Entrepreneurial Journalism at the City University of New York. If, Greg Newmark, Graduate School of Journalism. If by any chance you're not a subscriber, uh, this is a, a, a um, printed product. It's going to go out of fashion very quickly. But, um, <laughs> That's actually my next book. While you published. can, it's got great authority and uh, elegance, and uh, you should definitely subscribe. Um, thank you for coming. Thank you, Jeff, for um, speaking to the past.